morning campers, Mark Atwood here, on Friday, I believe it's a Friday, whatever that means. Do you think we'll have days of the week in 5D? Will they even matter? I mean, days of the week is ridiculous, isn't it? Everybody's work, 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 Monday to Friday, got to get enough money in to pay the rent, buy the food. Oh, it's Saturday. Crack open the booze. Oh, that probably on the Friday night, actually. And that, that's sort of still in me, actually. I still have that kind of, oh, I've worked hard all week. And even though I don't have a normal schedule, and I haven't had one <laughs> my whole life, actually, I can't remember the last time I did. I worked nine to five. It was probably my business in England, actually. I remember, yeah, so I set this business up and it was really huge, uh, successful. And one morning, I remember my um, ex-wife and me in the car pulled into my car parking space in my Jaguar. Sorry, darling, I appear to have left my wallet in the Jag. Would you mind paying the bill for me? And I had my big watch on, my tag her. And I, was, I wasn't very happy. I wasn't very happy. And this was around the time I was doing, I was going to retreats and I was on a fasting retreat. I went on a peyote weekend. I went on an ayahuasca retreat. I was searching for my soul, um, which is what we're all doing, right? Anyway, I pulled into this car park in space one morning and it was like 8.30 or something. And I turned to my then wife and I said, what the fuck am I doing? And she went, what do you mean? I said, I didn't start this bit. I didn't set this business up so that I could turn up at nine in the morning and do an eight hour shift every day for five days a week. And she looked at me and she said, you, you sound like a complete wanker. And I was like, mm, am I though? Because I didn't, you know, when you set up a business, you don't do it to have a job. You know, you do it because you want to be financially free. Uh, but then, you know, the business ends up running. This is why people like me who start businesses should never be, or I rarely carry on as the CEO of that business or the managing director, because we're creator energies, and creator energies are no good at running businesses long term uh, in the role of management. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a. Uh, I would say, I, I think I'm a good people manager, but um, I don't think many people who know me think that that's the case. But, um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway, so I said that that morning and um, that wasn't a good exchange. And, um, yeah, what's the point of this? What's the point of this podcast? What are you doing, boy? Are you going to say anything that makes any sense? Well, actually, the title of this podcast might sound a little bit irrelevant to the times we're in. I mean, I'm going to call this uh, podcast, Are Vampires Real? Are Vampires Real? What do you mean, Dracula? Are oh, the children of the night. What sweet music they make. That was Gary Oldman's version from Francis Ford Copula, Cop, Copulation. Hello, I'm Francis Ford Copulation. Would you like to go on a dat with me? A dat? What's a dat? I have no idea. Yeah, that film was weird. Keanu Reeves' worst English accent in history. Mind you, not as bad as my George Carlin the other day, but um, are vampires real? Now, the reason I'm triggered for this... Triggered? I'm not triggered, but you know what I mean. The reason why I'm going to talk about vampires today is because... I was sent a video, well, I wasn't sent a video, there's a Telegram group for the Weapons of Mass Protection Club, or the Mass Protection Club, which is a monthly Zoom meeting, me and Abby do, Abby Wynn, co-author of Weapons of Mass Protection, practical tools for spiritual warfare, and we did a call last night, <clears throat> and it's a private Zoom, just an hour a month, and it was really good last night, there was only four people on it, and I loved that, because it was really intimate, and everybody got to chat and talk and it's uh it was actually quite draining because it's these, these deep spiritual conversations and, and private as well so i'm not going to share what we talked about but um you know people's experiences at the moment are off the charts weird 
So therefore, talking about vampires is not that weird right now. But um, in that Telegram group, one of the members is um, the lovely Tanya, who took my picture that's on the back of the book and on the back of uh, God Wins and on every podcast that I do. Uh, because when I was in South Carolina, Tanya, I'm probably going to get a surname wrong, sorry, Tanya, Aluisio, Aluisio. <laughs> She'll kill me for that. Anyway, she drove with her daughter 798 miles just to take my portrait. And if you if you want to engage with Tanya, shotthebreeze.com. I've never met a photographer like her. I've had my picture taken a lot of times over the years um, by professional photographers. And this was different. She was trying to get to the essence of me. And I was not the same person then that I am now I have to say I was a little more f- I was a little more what's the word less less grounded I mean it was just after lockdowns I was touring America and the energy I was it was crazy energy on that tour and exhausting so it was a and it was a very emotional day actually that's when I um yeah that's when I met a few people that I'd not met properly before anyway it was it was it was very um spiritual experience having a picture taken with Tanya and we stayed in touch um loosely I'm terrible at returning messages but um just because I'm so bloody busy and trying to live my life and trying to take care of lots of this spinning a lot of plates I mean I say I've not worked in 30 years or whatever but I actually work longer hours and harder than anybody I've ever met (laughs) I'm a workaholic actually Um, but um, anyway there was a really interesting video posted in the telegram group this morning and it's from a a channel um, called fat girl freestyle go and look that up on YouTube Um, lovely lovely woman uh, in New Orleans and the video is called vampires in New Orleans my experience so you can find that on YouTube and go and subscribe to her channel because she's she's really got a lovely energy about her. I can't, I don't know if I can find out what her actual name is. But her name is Kimberly M. Dennessy, a.k.a. Fat Girl Freestyle. She's a, a purveyor of fat girl friendly fiction and female rage fiction, creator, writer, mother, fringe dweller, NOLA girl, if somebody knows what no I should look that up. I don't know what that means. Daughter, self-published author, queer, seeker, universal being, light worker, rebel. I like her a lot. I listened to her video this morning and it triggered a number of memories in me. I'm going to play her video shortly. But the reason I'm going to play this is because I know she's telling the truth. She's talking about her experience in New Orleans as a kind of a cab driver. And um, I, I don't know what she... She describes it as something else, like shared ride driver or something. I don't know. I've not been to New Orleans ever. Although I did once work in a cafe in Sarasota in Florida as a waiter. I also lent money to the cafe owner to keep the cafe open because it was in trouble. And I just sold my first business. I think I was about 22. And um, that was called Cafe New Orleans. And that's when I learned about beignets. Um extremely fattening but very nice and things like uh, jambalaya and Cajun blackened chicken and there's a New Orleans is a wonderful hot, hot melting pot of different um, cultures like Germanic and uh, Hispanic and uh, African and, and it's just a, I should really go to New Orleans but maybe the reason I've never been is because I know there's vampires there there's actually vampires everywhere. So I'll just tell you a little bit about some of my vampiric experiences myself. But before I do that, I'm going to go back to one of the key concepts that made me understand that we are a captured race and that we do live on a farm and that we are the farm animals. And that concept is the concept of louche, which I first learned from reading one of David Icke's books. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been The Perception Deception, um, which I read on a holiday in France about, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago. 
um, took all the kids to this beautiful farm in France and lived in a, it was glamping really, lived in a posh tent and drank sheep's milk every day. I remember that. But I was, <clears throat> the kids were small at the time and I had this giant book. Sorry, the magpies are fighting in the garden. It's so funny, the magpies, there's three of them here. There's a mother and a father and there's a baby one. And I never knew this about baby magpies. They, they, I often throw, if there's any spare um, meat from dinner the night before, I will put it in the garden in the morning because the birds love it, especially if it's fat or bacon or something. And then it's so funny because the mother or father will come down and start feeding and the, and the baby will st st stand next to them not pick up the food and just wait, still wait to be fed. And it, it looks as big as the other magpies. It's like, magpies don't grow up very quickly. Anyway, that's an aside. Um, and also magpies, when they're, <coughs> when they're around you, apart from one for sorry, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy, I can't remember the five and six and seven, something to do with gold and silver. Apart from that, uh, magpies are, uh, as a spiritual animal, are a symbol of duality because of the black and the white. And it's really important to pay attention to the animals that show up in your life. Uh, if I've not mentioned this before, I, this, this started really, you know, when I started seeing the numbers 12, 15 years ago, 11, 11, 11, 11, when you, when, you, when you start seeing them so much, it's like, what is this? And that's what starts you starting to unpack the whole spiritual nature of this uh, journey that we're on. Um, and then the animals start showing up. Uh, I remember once there was this, I was talking about caterpillars and then this caterpillar was in my kitchen and I wrote a blog post at the time called Synchronicity and the Caterpillar as if I was a very wise sage and I was really just, you know, stabbing in the dark. But um, there was a time in Morocco where a white dove just appeared out of nowhere and literally sat outside my bedroom window for two weeks every day until I paid attention to it, until I looked it up. It's something spiritual, I can't remember what it is, I'd have to go and look it up again, but um, that's what I teach my kids as well, is like, if, if you notice these things, uh, go and look them up. And if you don't find the answer on Google, go to Yandex, which is the Russian search engine, yandex.com, <coughs> which is often a great place to do research. Um, People are, use duck, duck, go. Duck, go. Duck, duck, go is just as bad as Google. Right? So I don't buy into all that. Uh, don't use these things because they're owned by the cabal. I mean, so what? Just go and use whatever you can to find whatever you need to find. And you will find it. Um, same as those people who say, no, I don't use WhatsApp. Get me on Signal. I'm like, I've got so many fucking apps. You want me to, you're going to message me on Signal? I don't even respond to all the WhatsApp messages I get. How do you expect me to respond to a Signal and the other thing is, they know everything anyway. So don't be afraid of um, being tracked and monitored. You're being tracked and monitored wherever you go. <clears throat> it's just more fear if you are living like that. If you're like, well, I can't, I can't buy a book on Amazon because it's owned by the cabal. Well, really? Does it make any difference? Does it really make any difference? I don't think so. You've got to get everybody in the world's not buying books on Amazon to actually make a difference. And that's not happening anytime soon. Anyway, going off on a tangent, back to vampires. So, um, Tanya shared this video and it triggered some memories. And, and the first thing is about Lush. Now, if you don't know, Lush is an energy that you generate when you're in a state of fear or anxiety. The whole system that we live in is designed to generate Lush. Why? Well, because, according to David Icke, archons, fourth dimensional entities, feed off of that energy that we give off. So therefore, they're constantly creating um, a world where we don't know that we are fractals of God. We are fractals of the prime creator. Because we don't know that, we, we believe they're programming. So the school system and everything, program, 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 Go to work, go to work, get a job, pay your bills, pay your mortgage, get a mortgage, mort, gauge, death, grip. It's all there in the language, right? So the system's like that. And then, okay, let's create a war. Let's create scarcity. Let's talk about, 
you know, when the Chancellor of the United Kingdom comes out and holds up his fucking briefcase and says, I'm putting beer up by 17. I mean, I bought a packet of cigarettes here in Ireland the other day and there was 17 euros. The same packet of cigarettes in Morocco is three euros. And every time I buy it, and I know I've got to stop, but don't nag me. Every time I buy them, I'm like, I say to the teller or the person, but that's an American term, isn't it? The person behind the till, the shop assistant, I say, uh, uh, there's another, there's another f- 16 quid tax to the communist government. And they look at me like, sometimes they go, yeah, you're right. Or they go, uh, <laughs> it's like that time I asked for butter. <laughs> uh, what's that? Um, you know, that's, <laughs> I think that's amusing because it's, it's showing the divide that's existing. Uh, but I'm not, I'm, I must not go off on tangents. I want to talk about vampires. So louche is one of the sources of food. Now, of course, any of you awake know that the biggest industry on this planet is young children. And the reason for that is because of adrenochrome. And adrenochrome, now I'm going to, I know some of you might be having your breakfast and don't want to hear this, so pause now if you don't know, uh, or if you don't want to hear something horrific, because I'm going to tell you something horrific now. So you have the opportunity to stop listening and then fast forward two minutes. But adrenochrome, and we have to face this, adrenochrome, because there are factories all over the world with children in cages underground underground bases full of children in cages 22,000 children missing every day for the last 80 years at least it's a billion children official statistics that doesn't count all the children that are grown underground that are bred by breeders the satanics call them breeders they have women in chains they impregnate them to breed babies for sacrifice these children are taken into rituals They are sexually abused. They are tortured, terrified, so that they create the maximum amount of adrenaline. That adrenaline pumps through their blood. And this is why Google has Google Chrome. This uh, adrenochrome is then extracted from the child via usually the eyeball with a syringe that is put into the pineal gland. The reason for that is because the pineal gland is where the DMT is. So when you mix adrenalized blood with DMT from a child that is less poisoned and, and more active in this, in this sense, and um, it's sick beyond belief. It is the one thing that I think will unite humanity when the truth is out about this. But it's such a horrific thing I, that I think that is the reason why God is making this plan take time because it, the time that it's taking this to unfold is saving lives and it's giving each soul on earth the chance to start facing these fears and wake up and sometimes those people have to be woken up with a jolt which is why you've got so many horrific things happening worldwide at the moment because it is waking people up and, and it's taking them out of their slumber and sometimes you just got to, you know, it's God's plan. I trust it. I trust it. What choice is there? Do you, do you want to trust it? Or do you want to think, oh, no, we're all, we're all doomed. We're all doomed. We're not doomed. But that's the horrific truth about adrenochrome, right? Which is very vampiric, is it not? And the heads of these satanic families of the 300 families of the you know all these organizations the knights of malta the council on foreign relations the bilderberg group they're all satanists and they feed on the blood of children particularly um so you see you've got adrenalized blood you've got loose fourth dimensional entities blah 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 it's very interesting uh, from a from a dispassionate perspective, because it, for me, learning who the enemy is and how they really work is part of this, and vampires are part of this, whether you believe that or not. Just bear with me, because I 
there's a few stories I want to tell you, but I can't. I, I'm not going to give away f- full details. I'm just going to ask you to trust me. There were some people that I knew. I, I've known a lot of people in my life, and there were some people I knew that were very connected, very connected at a very high level. To I can't even tell you that because I don't want to. It, it, there's a lot of good reasons why I can't tell you that at the moment. Um, a lot of things that I know I can't share until this is over. Put it this way, God's put me in unbelievable positions where I've actually seen and experienced things, um, you know, very closely, which have given me the, um, is it confidence or is it, uh, or the knowledge that is not theoretical, let's put it that way. A lot of um, conspiracy theorists, researchers, truth seekers, whatever you want to call us, <coughs> talk about stuff from zero experience just because they've read stuff for me it was different i've i've been put in front of unbelievable amounts of um situations and people that i had no idea that i was there you know this was happening at the time it's only when i look back at it i go oh my god so anyway there were these people uh, and i and i and i they were they were i knew that they were sucking on my energy but i couldn't work out why and that was letting demons in and then that led to alcohol and drugs and situations that were not healthy for me and and I was taken close to the edge uh, quite a number of of times but I always withdrew I was always protected but there was one time um, I was talking to these people and mid conversation they just froze like two robots just like deactivated and I was, I carried on talking and I realised that they were not talking anymore. And I was like, hello. And I went, you know, up to them, clicking fingers. And they weren't waking up. And 20 minutes later, basically, they just carried on, they just carried on talking as if they were continuing from 20 minutes earlier. And this was really strange. These people were people that had told me snippets of things. And one of the snippets they told me involved um, being related to people that had, that were very high up, who'd had full blood transfusions, that's the way they described it, and were living beyond any reasonable expectations of normal human life, which was, you know, vampiric, isn't it? That's the definition of a vampire, as far as I know. But they also talked about memory loss. And memory loss is key to a lot of this. It's like... Whatever happened to me in a hospital in the 1970s when I was out of it for a few days and I was abused, right? What was that abuse? Was I taken up on a spaceship? Was I sexually abused? Did they, did they take my blood? I don't know what happened. My higher self knows. I've always kind of known something happened then. And this was all confirmed by uh, the body code with Julie at Renine Wellness who did the dowsing. And she's, you know, she's a professional dowser. She's helped police solve crimes with her dowsing and she's been at it her whole life and she's 72 now so you know she's the most trustworthy person i i know in that area uh yeah so this this um pausing of these people in real life was was a really bloody strange experience and this links through because of the the links of these people to let's say Let's say a, a family that is well known in the world, a family that I think is currently dead, but still in the public eye. Yeah, the sausage fingers, uh, Mount Button, you know, Philip, Lizzie, Lizzie the Lizard, vampires, hundred percent. I tell that story about why Prince Philip didn't recognise my uniform in St. James's Palace. And I intrinsically, or, or Claire cognizantly, know it was because he'd just come up from the dungeons, probably drinking the blood of children. How do I know that? Well, because I was sent on a mission. And this is a thing I've never talked about, but about 10 years ago, I was somebody that I knew, spiritually connected to me in some way, 
contacted me and said, right, we need you to go under Buckingham Palace and uh, there's going to be an altar there and you need to guard that while we go and do our work. And this is all spiritual work, spiritual warfare. And I, I was at a party and it was like, I had a time to go and do it. I said, excuse me, I'm going to the toilet. I went to the toilet. I sat down. I did the job that they asked me to do. And then I carried on with the party. That's how weird my life has been. And then, you know, I, you know, just look at Prince Philip. I mean, what was he, 98 when he died, allegedly? I think he died before that, but just look at his face. I mean, when I saw his face in 1988, I think he was supposed to be 70, but he looked like he was a 1,000 years old. And his skin was just horrific. I, just, I remember his skin and his eyes. And he didn't look human. His skin was like leather. Never seen skin like that on anybody. Like, a, like an animated corpse, but his eyes were lit with a light that was the eyes were blue but it, it was it was otherworldly or animalistic I don't know what the word is I should know better as a poet but I don't plan these chats properly I just talk so experiences um, let me I tell you what I'll play I'll play the video of the um lovely lady in New Orleans and let you have a listen to this because it's about nine minutes long. Have a listen to her. About the time I met a vampire. I tried to do this story the other day on live and it just did not work out. But anyway, I just decided to record a video. People have been asking me about the story. So here it goes. I'm a rideshare driver in New Orleans. So, of course, I encounter all types of people from all walks of life. This one particular ride was very interesting. Now, this was a couple of years ago when this occurred. And I'm going to tell you, for the most part, I remember what she said. I do not remember what she looked like. <laughs> Um, and there are some details that when the experience was over, like I had completely forgotten some things, but anyway, <clears throat> so I'm riding, pick up this passenger and I remember our conversation and the crazy thing, the craziest thing is I can remember her voice I can I can and even as I'm telling you this I can hear her voice in my head and I can even picture like this part of her face around her mouth her lips I, I can see them moving as she's talking to me and I remember her hand being on my shoulder, and I remember what it felt like when she touched me. But a lot of other stuff, it's like, was just completely erased. So I pick her up, and I do know that we were having conversation. I talked to many of my passengers. And she is telling me I have really great energy. So I told her, thank you. You know, she asked me some things about myself, you know, nothing too private, nothing with too many details. So, you know, I just kind of gave her some general info. And I remember her telling me that she wasn't from here, that, that I do remember. And then she proceeds to tell me how much she loved New Orleans, how much she loved being there, living there, et cetera, et cetera. I do recall asking her where she was from originally. And all she told me was that she was from very far away. And it's, it's funny again, because I like, 
I'm hearing her voice in my head as if this is weird. Um, and I've never shared this story with anybody. So TikTok, you're getting it first. <laughs> um, she touched my shoulder at one point. And this is where things got really strange. She touched my shoulder. And I felt like I just froze. And even as I'm talking to you right now, I can distinctly remember that feeling of feeling frozen. And my hands were on the wheel because I, I, I could see the hand, my hands on the wheel. The car wasn't moving. And being frozen in that moment, I hear her voice, but not like I'm here talking to you in my head. I hear her voice telling me, don't be scared. That she's not going to harm me. And then after that, we're moving again. And I remember kind of turning and looking like that. And she was sitting back in the seat and her hands were on her lap. And I said, what, what did you do to me? And she just smiled. And she says, I just leached some of your energy. And I said, what? She said, I just leached some of your energy. She said, this is going to sound crazy. But I can assure you it's true. I'm a vampire. She said, but I'm not the type of vampire that you've been taught about in books and movies. She said, those types of vampires exist, but they're very rare these days. I'm a vampire that feeds off of energy. And all I have to do is touch you to get it. She's in New Orleans is a great place for her and her kind to exist. And that there are quite a few members of their tribe is what she called them. I think I remember this part of our conversation so significantly because I I believe when she touched me, she implanted something in my mind, whether you want to call it a memory or a thought or an idea, but she, she gave me something of herself probably to where I can recall this portion of the interaction between us. Maybe she knew that eventually I would share the story with others and Therefore, maybe make it a little bit more acceptable for them to start, you know, for her and her members to start presenting themselves. I don't know. I don't know why she, she even chose me for this. But she told me that there are vampires that survive off of good energy there are vampires that survive off of bad energy. There are vampires that survive off of sexual energy. And there are vampires that survive off of blood. And New Orleans is the only place in the world where you can find members of all four of those vampire tribes. Maybe she wanted me to remember this portion of it as a warning. 
I don't know. <laughs> but I know she wasn't lying just because of how I felt. And, and, and even now, it, it's crazy because I, I still feel like her hand is on my shoulder, which makes me wonder when she touched me, did she create some type of psychic connection between the two of us? I don't know, but I think I'm going to, I need to end this. Anyway, um, I don't remember where I dropped her off at. I don't even remember dropping her off. The next thing I remember doing clearly was being in a part of town that I didn't remember how I even got there. And it was like two hours later. And I was just in a parking lot. <laughs> just in a parking lot. And I know it sounds weird, y'all. Um, I think I'm going to, I probably shouldn't even record it. This. I probably shouldn't even be talking. I probably should not even be talking about this. I, I shouldn't. You know, that's very interesting, isn't it? Um, fat Girl Freestyle. If you're listening to this on Substack, and I hope you are, if you're listening to this somewhere else, please go and have a look at diary of a conspiracy theorist.substack.com and subscribe there. <laughs> because it's, it's a richer experience. Um, but that, yeah, and I'll put a link to uh, Fat Girl Freestyle's video underneath that on Substack, go and subscribe to support her work. I mean, at the end of that, she was saying, I'm not, I probably shouldn't even be saying this. And you see, that's part of the problem. This, this is carrying on from the last podcast about, you know, sending demons love and light. Um, I don't think that's what we should be doing at all. I think we should be exposing them all and getting rid of them. Um, that's my opinion. You may disagree and that's fine. I like living in a world where people can discuss stuff rather than have dogma about these things. Uh, you know, and I'm happy to be convinced otherwise, but in my experience, we've got to put the lights on them. But interesting, three three things come up for me there. Firstly, I want to talk about Tom Cruise. Um, and I'll probably forget these as I ramble on, but I, I want to talk about the Rothschilds in, in um, where was it? I knew I'd forget the name of the place. I went on a holiday. Corfu. Corfu is a Greek island. Um, it was, is it a country? I think it's, a, it's an island. I don't know what it is. I can't remember. But Corfu is a beautiful place opposite Albania. And don't let me forget about Tom Cruise. I should write that down. And, and opposite, uh, we hired this beautiful house up in the hills with a infinity pool and you know there was about 10 of us there on the holiday about i don't know when it was 12 years ago and on that island of corfu i just the, the rothschild had a house five minutes away and it was one of those it was very similar to the time i was flying in a cessna over vancouver island and the pilot of that plane i was about 17 she was the daughter of an F-16 pilot and we went up for a flight because I was seconded over to um, Canada as part of a, an RAF thing back in the day. And uh, we, she flew around, she pointed down to this giant home, stately home basically, and she said that that's the headquarters of the Satanists. And I've told this story many times on my podcast, but, uh, and I was like, what did you say? You know, over the headphones. What did you say? What? Say to this. Yeah, say to this. And I was like, oh, what? You know, I, I was fucking wow. And she said, you can't get to that house. There's no, unless you know how to drive to that house, you, you, the way you like, like one of the Hammer Horror movies. And it was the same on this island of Corfu with the Rothschild's house. There's a few things about it. Firstly, um, you, there was no way into it. You couldn't, you know, if you got on a boat on, which we did, and 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 go past it on a boat, you could see it. And there was like a 
billion dollar yacht out, out the back. And there's, you know, there's loads of pictures of people like George Osborne, who was Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, back then. And, you know, he was there, pictured at their house. I mean, this is a very, very dark, dark place. And they, you know, the story was that they bought all the land in Albania that was that they could see across the water to make sure nobody built on it and sport their view. But I got a very strong feeling being in Corfu for two weeks that the vi- the villagers in Corfu were exactly the same kind of uh, energy that the villagers have in the old um, Dracula movies. You know, the Count lives up on the castle on the hill and we are its servants. There's a place near here uh, where I think Mountbatten used to live, Mullug Moor, and the house is on, on the coastline. And as you drive up to it, it's got this foreboding feeling and it looks like Dracula's castle upon this hill and, and and this is true this stuff is is real and they do live a, you know what you what you get there the sense of her video was that they're very much amongst us and I've said this throughout my podcast we are surrounded by them you know even in the west of Ireland I have witnessed at St Patrick's Day parades one in particular where a couple of years ago in the middle, it was like a typical St. Patrick. Patrick, by the way, is a made-up name taken from the word patrician. Patrician is a higher member of Roman society. It was a patrician that came around Ireland raping and pillaging and terrifying everybody and casting curses and all sorts of dark stuff <laughs> that the Catholic Church stole that story and turned it into St. Patrick and then because the, because the Catholic Church is satanic at its heart, inverted that so that people would celebrate this patrician. So they called him, so he was never even canonised, not even a saint. So all those poor, deluded people around the world that celebrate St. Patrick's Day are actually giving their energy to an evil entity. And that's what they do with everything, the same as Christmas, the same as everything, Right. So, uh, yeah, I, at one St. Patrick's Day parade, I witnessed two children dressed in extremely well put together costumes, expensively put together costumes, and they were dressed as vaccines. And then behind them were two men, two tall men. One was dressed with a gas mask on and a very long leather coat all the way down to his uh, jackboot feet, which is I immediately recognised as a satanic outfit. And the guy next to him was dressed as Kronos, or Father Time, uh, which Kronos is Saturn. They worship Saturn, the black cube of Saturn. Satan, same thing, right? So, you know, in the middle of tractor, 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 Satanist tractor, 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 yeah, classic car, tractor. That was the St. Patrick Day's parade that I witnessed that day. And, I, and it was hilarious. Well, it, you've got to have a sense of humour with this. Well, what I found hilarious, everybody's cheering as they're going by. And I'm like, am I the only one? You know, it's like being in They Live. Am I the only one who can see this? Oh, my God, I'm so alone. That was the feeling that I got at the time. But, of course, we've never been alone, and we're not alone. Um, We've all got each other, and God's with you all the time, and you are protected, otherwise you wouldn't still be here. So remember that. It's very important to remember that, because darker times are coming. We We are in the darkness right now. And it is yeah, difficult sometimes to hold on to the side of the boat. But I did love that video. And I'm very grateful to Tanya for posting it. Because it did trigger a lot of different thoughts. And then one of those thoughts is, is Tom Cruise, right? So I went to see Top Gun Maverick. Um, now Top Gun, the movie, the original one, was massively influential on me. Because I was trying to get, I was a teenager trying to get into the RAF at the time. Or, or dreaming of becoming a pilot in the RAF, uh, a, a Top Gun pilot. And uh, so I came out of the cinema after that, punch in the air. Yeah, I'm gonna, yeah that's my job. That's what I'm going to do. And after watching Top Gun Maverick, which was a fabulous film, a really fantastic film full of patriotism, full of um, friendships, no wokeness whatsoever. There was a female pilot in it who was brilliant, and but it, was, it wasn't like she was better than everybody else. She was just part of the team. 
uh, instead of the usual bullshit where she would be better than everybody else and, and aren't all men shit at everything. Um, it, it was just really well done. And I'm 100% convinced of two things. That that's a white hat movie. Right? I'm also convinced that that wasn't Tom Cruise in that film. What do you mean, Mark? Well, um, I, wait, where do I start with this? Um, so after watching Top Gun Maverick again at home not long ago, I thought well, it'd be interesting to go and watch the original Top Gun. So I went to watch the original Top Gun. I literally couldn't watch more than 15 minutes of that film because Tom Cruise was completely different. I don't mean younger. I don't just mean younger. I mean completely different. His energy in that film was really, I don't know what the word is. It's uh, vampiric. Yeah. And predatory. But it wasn't just the character, the way it was written and directed. It was, it was him. His energy was very fucking predatory. Now, I, I paused. I, I literally couldn't watch any more. And then I thought, I wonder if it's worth going back and looking at Interview with a Vampire. So I did. I went and put that on. I couldn't watch more than 10 minutes. My soul could not watch it. And if you look at Tom Cruise in that film, and I remember thinking at the time, Tom Cruise playing a vampire, that's such a weird choice of role at the time, um, which is all set in New Orleans, you know, again, links to that video. And it's kind of like, you know, that film would kind of make you feel um, sympathetic, I suppose. In a way, it's a bit like the Francis Ford copulation film of Dracula. You know, the Gary Oldman portrayal of Dracula in that is one, you know, he's a horrific murderer, but he, yeah, there's a love story behind it, even though it's a very weird one. Um, so are they looking for acceptance? Well, yes, they are. Because if you link this to LGBTQ, and, you know, very sticky subjects. I mean, the woman I just played you describes herself as queer. I have no problem with anybody being queer um, or homosexual or whatever. I don't care. What, and whatever makes you happy. I mean, whatever. God made us all in different ways. The problem is that homosexuality has been engineered into society via um, drugs, mainly. Um, you've only got to look at... Um, you know, there's a great meme uh, that went around over the last few years and it was a picture of Dennis Hopper with a cigarette and his sunglasses on his Harley Davidson and his cowboy hat riding in the sun. Men, 1970. And then there was a picture of a effeminate looking man with a man bag on an electric scooter holding a soy latte. Men, 2021 or something. You know, they have literally, we have been changed. You've only got to look at the, the, the bodily hair of men now compared to my dad's era. I did, the men were much smellier, much hairier, much more Neanderthal style <laughs> than they are now. And I miss that, actually. Men not being men. There are still some good men about, but there's far, few and far between. And I don't know how some people dodged a bullet and some people didn't. But the point is that Tom Cruise <laughs> chose this role based on the Anne Rice novels, Interview of the Vampire. I think there was supposed to be a series of them. I don't know why there wasn't. But again, I couldn't watch more than 10 minutes of that film. I cannot watch. There's some films I just can't watch. I, not in the way that I did years ago. I mean, I've always been sensitive. I've never been a horror film fan. I mean, I watched a lot of horror films when I was a kid, but they weren't like the ones that came out later. I remember going to see Nightmare on Elm Street. I think, what was that, 1984, 5? Uh, with my girlfriend at the time. And um, I think, we, yeah, we walked out of that film. I, I couldn't watch it. And I, I've never... It took me years to watch The Exorcist. And I forced myself to watch it. I knew... It's so interesting, actually, thinking back on this. Because everybody watched The Exorcist. I mean, that was 1973, I think. And it was a film that I grew up terrified of. Probably because of my own demonic experiences. But also because my higher self knew and was guiding me away from it. But during my dark days, I did sit and try to watch films that I thought were culturally important for me to watch because I studied films a lot. 
And if, if you're interested in films, two books you must read, Adventures in the Screen Trade and The Hero of a Thousand Faces by Joseph Campbell. And if you read those two books, you will be able to write a great film script. I've got tons of film scripts in my head that I haven't actually produced yet because I'm too busy doing this. But hopefully one day I'll be able to make some some uh, proper movies that are, that are wholesome and take you on a journey and escape. Uh, you know, it, it's great to be taken on a ride, isn't it? But if that ride is full of hope and love and fun and heroism, you know, we all love those stories. But, you know, so many films have uh, subverted those themes. Um, this is why I think, you know, the White Hats have been bringing films out to reverse the brainwashing uh and i this is why i think that isn't actually tom cruise because i do think he's one of the, one of the uh, total bad guys uh, or the real tom cruise and i uh i remember saying to my kids i think it was 2017 when star wars a uh, star wars story rogue one was it came out and in that film, there was CGI of Peter Cushing. How weird is this that this links to Dracula? Because Peter Cushing, of course, played Van Helsing in the Christopher Lee horror horror film. Horror 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 with CGI in that film. But the CGI was made to look, and this is what I said to my kids afterwards, I said, what's really interesting is how bad the CGI was on him. And I think that's because they wanted to show us, uh, they didn't want us to know how good CGI really is. Do you see what I mean? So, you know, the Top Gun Maverick film was promoted as this film that was made with no CGI whatsoever. You know, it was all done. And all the guys, all the actors actually went up in the Tomcats and did these um, flying scene sequences for real. And when you watch it, it's fucking real. It's very realistic. And that's why it's such a good film. Because you really believe you're in the planes with them. The characters are well drawn out. It follows the hero's journey. It's got, it's a bloody good film. But I don't think, I think that was CGI Tom Cruise. That's how good they are. And I think that's on purpose too, because they want to, they're going to tell us one day, look, we, we can recruit, we can make everything look real. And they can. The, the technology is hundreds of years in advance of what we think it is. So yeah, that would make complete sense to me. You might disagree, tell me in the comments. Uh, but yeah, have I got any further to go with the vampire stuff? Yeah, well, you know, back to what she was saying, they're, you know, you could be terrified by that. You could think, oh my God, we're surrounded by vampires. But actually think about your own life. Think about missing memories. Think about those weird times when you've met people. When she said that maybe there was this spiritual connection between her and this vampire in the cab, I was immediately taken back again to Prince Philip. Because I can, st I've said this many times, it's just, it's just hit me. I can still feel his handshake and I can still see him looking in my eye. He knew who I was. He, he, he suddenly realised, because I gave him a dirty look and I said, and I was sarcastic with him, when he said, uh, Royal Air Force. All right, that's right, sir. Really sarcastic. And he looked, that look was, oh. And he was like, and he, and he, and he, but he couldn't do anything because at first he was in public, but the look he gave me, haunt, well, it doesn't haunt me, but it stays with me. So I wonder if there was a psychic link there too because all the vampire films especially Dracula um, show Dracula with this incredible power of seduction uh, and people just go into this dreamlike state so that they're easy to eat I suppose and that links of course to Prince Charles who famously said that he um, was proud of being a descendant of Vlad the Impaler, upon which the story of Dracula was allegedly based. And Bram Stoker wrote that story in the 1890s, I think, um, based upon the stories of Vlad the Impaler, who was, your, who was real. He used to stick babies' heads on poles and terrify 
all the villagers. And why would Prince Charles, sorry, King Charles, although I don't think he, the real Prince Charles ever became king, why uh, would why would he be telling us that story if it wasn't for about this thing to get acceptance? And this is back to the LGBTQ thing. The Q, sorry, not the Q, but the plus is really for maps. Minor attracted people, paedophiles, pedophiles. Just go and look up the paedophile information exchange from 1978. It never went away. Harriet Harman MP was part of that. Um, go and do some research on that because it never went away. And what, you know, look at the satanic shit and the transvestites at the Olympics. They're trying to put it in your face to get acceptance. And maybe in one version of events, the stories going around about Macron's wife being a bloke uh, is part of that. You know, maybe they want this to come out for, for people to go, well, that's okay. That's okay that 14-year-old Macron was tutored by this bloke in a dress and probably Rogered in the classroom. I mean, there's, you know, where do, where do you go with that? You know, you, a, a, a decent society would never accept that. But there are people that do, are accepting these things. And those people are demonically possessed. And that's what it all comes down to. They do want acceptance. But another White Hat film, I'll, leave, I'll, leave, I'll end on this, Abram Lincoln, Vampire, Vampire Hunter. Gets terrible reviews online. But I really found that film interesting. And the timing of its release was interesting. And the story that it tells about the true story of Abraham Lincoln fighting these um, demonic vampire families that end up taking over the White House. Did they succeed? What do you think?